So our next talk is on building JavaScript applications with Haskell. And the authors are Axel Axel, Julian Spetterman, Alexander van Royden, and Joyce Kirchner. And as soon as the screen goes on, Alessandro will do the screen for the other ones. Yeah. Two screens. Yeah, there we are. Okay. So, um, why is this called building JavaScript applications with Haskell? Um, well, basically two reasons. One, we wanted to have something which, with which to showcase the UAC, which is the Utrecht Haskell compiler. So we want to sh shamelessly promote it. And then we thought, well, how can we do that? Uh, a way to get to a large group of people is by building web applications because web applications are hot and, and well, very well liked and stuff. So um, then we thought, okay, if you do web applications, what do you need? Well, for example, you need JavaScript. Um, yeah, it works. Okay, so there is only one problem with JavaScript, and this is it being JavaScript. Uh, uh, it has a fuzzy, well, it has a ugly syntax from our point of view. Uh, for provost, it has dynamic new typing, so, and there are no real type checkers available. Yeah, there are some which do some things. But it's not really as fun and, and secure as Haskell. So and there are some very peculiar evaluation rules that are out there. So um, you might turn up to build a JavaScript program and then doing it uh, then it does something totally different from what you expect. Uh, but unfortunately, JavaScript is actually the only uh, language you can use on, well, say, almost all browsers in the same way. So, yeah, we have to do something with JavaScript, but we want to use Haskell. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so, are there alternatives? Well, yeah, maybe you could create something that would run a Flash or Silverlight or any of the other applets, thingies out there. Uh, maybe you could write your own applet in which you can feed our Haskell and have a sort of kind of UHCI in the web browser thing. But then we'd have to write and support a applet for every browser. Not cool. Um, same goes for hacking at each browser for running uh, uh, Haskell directly in it. It's also not cool. Too much work. Uh, <laughs> You're from the lazy functional programming group. Right? Yes, <laughs> exactly. So uh, what we decided to do is say, well, um, so, okay, well, okay, JavaScript it is, okay, well, uh, let's do JavaScript. Mm, and we will use JavaScript as a high-level machine language in which we written our own language. Um, well, uh, basically, Haskell. So we write Haskell, we compile it to JavaScript in some way, which we'll see, we'll see momentarily, and we will have all nice Haskell thingies, like type safety, lazy evaluation, parcher application, and nice syntax, and um, well, all other nice goodies from Haskell, including package. Well, not part. Um, so other benefits would be that you could use any Haskell package, uh, binary package, package, thing, um, from on both the server and on your client, or maybe on it, that you use in some other program, you can use them everywhere. So also in the browser. Uh, which means that you can potentially eliminate uh, Aja Ajax calls to the server because you can do actual work on the client uh, instead of having to uh, well, uh, give the work to be done on the server and then it will compute it for you and then we'll give you back the results. You can do it at the client automatically. And indirectly you can even use quick check to run test cases of your uh, well your code, your application or your library that runs in the browser, but you can also through that test JavaScript library. That's fine. Right. Um, so what we basically use is a uh, is Lambda Calculus. Everything gets compiled back down to Lambda Calculus with uh, 
uh, longer abstraction and function application and this tiny little eval function. Um, so that's basically what we do. We compile Haskell to core, and then from there we go to lambda um, So we have this very nice add three function which has three, uh, three uh, numbers together. You'll see that we get a uh, function node here which receives, well, this is simplified, of course. So we have a function node which receives three arguments, x, y, and z, and it will return the result of the summation. In this case, it, it can be simplified as such because we use, uh, for integers, we just use the native integers uh, um, operators, but in uh, real life, uh, these pluses here would be of the same style with, with the app and application that you can see here. Because if we want to evaluate this um, function, we have an application node, and that um, is uh, then evaluated in the, uh, in the bottom line as our answer. And actually, the, the second line would like, uh, look like a combination of the third and fourth line. Um, so we also need to interact with JavaScript, unfortunately, because, well, the JavaScript things are out there, like jQuery and all the other frameworks, which make it easy for you to manipulate the DOM, uh, the document tree, and uh, well, there are some other libraries for modeling data, doing stuff. You might want to use, well, certainly you need to interact with JavaScript. But, and that's a hard thing, uh, JavaScript, as we said, is not nice. And on top of that, it's also strict, imperative, and object-oriented. Whereas Haskell is lazy, and purely functional. So we need some way to bridge this divide. Um, and we will do, use, uh, do this with the foreign function interface. And we extended the foreign function interface with something which we call the foreign expression language, which mm, pro uh, works as this kind of glue between Haskell and JavaScript. And could also work as a glue between Haskell and other object oriented languages. Um, so suppose you have a substring function, which is a uh, method of class string in JavaScript. Um, we can access this substring uh, function by using this syntax. So we have the person one sign here, and we have the, this dot, which it looks maybe a bit far. Um, make that it's well. And then we have the substring, and the uh, person two and person three permeates. And as you can see, uh, the type of substring is it something that goes from JS string to into to a JS string. Um, and what we essentially do is when we compile this, um, a call to substring in the Haskell world will, will get uh, rewritten or um, translated to a call to the JavaScript function. And it would like, look like, well, the variable that contains the JS string will go first, then follows it up, then follows the individual substring, and then we provide it to, with two other parameters. Uh, so in this case, JS string is the real JS native JavaScript string, and uh, a string as it well, string from Haskell would be some internal representation of our system. All right. So um, that was uh, sorry. So this is how to import functionality from JavaScript. Want to also want to export functionality. So if you want to provide your Haskell, beautiful Haskell program to the outside world to, because maybe some other guy is using a JavaScript library as his main tool of choice, you want to use, uh, provide your Haskell thing. So we can also, as you expect, export our Haskell functions. And then they are callable from JavaScript, in this case, by just calling my site. And what my sum is, is actually a function that will take in the arguments, pass them on to um, your, uh, the application form, and will evaluate the function application, and then um, we'll get back the result. Uh, note that you are responsible yourself for doing, um, well, basically the right thing. 
So if you, um, there is no type checking going on. And if you say that my sum will return some Haskell data type, so suppose, well, A3, for example, you will end up in the result uh, of my sum, will end up with some representation, with, with our runtime representation of a tree. So, and probably your receiving uh, program will not know what to do with it. So, consider this when you use it. Um, all right, so, um, objects. JavaScript being object oriented has objects and they're a pain to deal with, but they are also very convenient. So, how can we, um, well, work with these objects? And um, how can we represent, create, query them, etc.? So, this, this is uh, where the other bit of the FFI comes in. Uh, we have not JavaScript object, which um, is represented in Haskell as a JS pointer of, well, something. Um, and there are no constructors of this type. And so you cannot, well, go fit all with them around in your own code. You have to use the functions we provide for you to you in our in library. Um, and um, these libraries are available from a JavaScript library that we provide in addition to the JavaScript backend, uh, which is on GitHub. Everything is on GitHub anyway. Um, so, thank you. Um, so, as I said, we define some primitive JavaScript primitive functions that will uh, wrap around the, the JS pointers or the JavaScript objects and will give you access, uh, access to manipulate, uh, will enable you to manipulate function uh, objects. Um, so, uh, these functions are it can be imported with the print value convention, the true FFI, uh, and as a result of this, you can well get a sort of um, functional flavor to object interaction, but it's not completely functional, so there's no complete functional layer source over objects uh, like oh, Haskell or something. We do not do that, um, but maybe we will. Do it one day. Uh, and all, all of this is available from our uh, UHC JavaScript library. Um, so if you want to create a new JavaScript object, we have prime prim made object, which uh, you give the name of the constructor, the JavaScript, the name of the object or the constructor, and it will try to give you uh, or to instantiate a new JavaScript object, object with that type and it will get it back to you. Uh, in the same way, you can also create an empty JavaScript object and it will give you uh, a reference to it as well. So, um, now for the fun part, we also want to uh, modify fields in objects. So we have a getter, a setter, and a, also a modifier, um, uh, which are these three functions. And as you can see, we have a JS pointer B around, and, um, uh, which, if you have, a if you request the, some field from an object, well, you have to pass it to some object, and then you give it the name of the field, and then you all of a sudden will get some value, a value of type a in I O, and well, this is looks very like undefined, so you can actually get anything there. Which you're not guaranteed that it's actually your product that you're expecting. Um, same goes for print set and modify. Um, so, but I think it's, well, most, it's due to the nature of the FFI that you as a program are very responsible for doing it right. Um, all right, so we can also uh, do this purely by. Uh, after every modifying action, we clone the whole object completely, and then um, you can, in a more functional way, modify your JavaScript object. Um, right. So an example: suppose you have a book object 
with a good data type which contains an author, a title, and the amount of pages, um, we can create a new object, which, uh, book, which will be in B, and then for each field, the author, title, and pages, we call set attribute with some value and uh, on which object to set it. But you can imagine that, well, if you want to do this for a lot of fields or a lot of objects, it becomes very laborious and tedious and annoying. So we follow something else. Um, because if you look at data uh, Haskell records and JavaScript objects, they are actually pretty familiar. They are just, well, buckets with fields and values. And you can pretty much use them in the same way. So why could you not convert between them automatically? You can. Uh, this is why we provide this two object or two object or two object function, uh, which is part of the runtime system, and it will automatically convert, magically convert any type, SQL type, to some JavaScript object for you. Uh, it's not guaranteed to work in every case. Uh, for instance, for uh, something that's already in it, it will give you maybe some other result. Um, but in the case of a book, uh, we can just alter our book and call two object, two objects uh, on it, and then act, uh, request the pages, and you will see that the amount of pages is actually incremented very well. Um, so the, all of this we used to port a, uh, an application developed in Edward's uh, for a high school students. Um, the application made a lot of use, uh, uh, use of a lot of jQuery and JavaScript, other JavaScript to uh, well, uh, have a drag and drop UI and um, uh, doing some other um, administrative stuff and communicating with the server, which did all the um, hard work because it was meant for high school students to get acquainted with product and well, for that we needed product unifica uh, unification of product terms uh, which can be very intensive. Um, so we ported the whole JavaScript uh, bit to Haskell. We retained all functionality and uh, through the uh, binding we also provided in the JavaScript library we interface with jQuery for the drag and drop. So there is still jQuery being used, but we actually don't write any jQuery in our own application. Um, and actually, because we were able to use any uh, Haskell library, we could also um, use the Utrecht uh, parser combinators from the Languages and Compiler uh, course, as well as a uh, Nanoprolog library, which con contains uh, the unifying <coughs> of uh, product terms as well. So where previously all the product stuff was done at the server, we could now, can now do it at our um, at the cloud. So uh, and this actually well yields rather nice performance on modern WebKit browsers, but um, on other browsers with less me efficient memory management tends to run a bit slower or at least with some noticeable lag. Um, and doing very excessive product backtracking will slow down uh, the user interface. Um, so, and, and there is also this case, because the, in JavaScript you have no threading, so if you have a function that's really busy, your web page just blocks. All right, so what do we do, want to do next? Uh, we want to fix threading by uh, implementing fork IO, but we don't know really how because well, uh, there is no JavaScript, uh, no support for threading in JavaScript, so maybe we can use web workers um, to support more Haskell function uh, applications. Like we want to extend the UHD with more, um, um, well, more language extensions, so it becomes more usable in general and also more uh, useful for web applications. And, uh, well, more abstract GUI, functional reactive programming style for uh, creating GUIs would be also, would also be nice, and communication with servers like 
as in uh, cloud vessel would also be nice to have, very nice to have. So what we have shown is that UHC is actually quite great because we can we can could easily extend it with the JavaScript backend. We can write Haskell programs, um, well, uh, write Haskell programs that can get compiled to JavaScript. And we can interface with those Haskell libraries from JavaScript and the other way around. We can write a complete application. And, well, we only have two variables uh, which can be finished at uh, the right time. Um, and if you want more information, you can visit the website to find it. So, any questions? Yes. I was hoping to see some attractive web application now in Haskell, but ah. it didn't show us any code. So oh, you want to see the code? code? Yeah, some uh, uh, how the Haskell code actually looks okay, like. So, so um, you, you want to see the translated code or the Haskell code? Maybe the original. Want to see the running application? Yeah. So which one do we want to see? So um, all the right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, first the beautiful Haskell code, and then maybe the uh, ugly JavaScript. Yeah, right. well, maybe we defer yes. looking at the code to right. the barbecue after. So beautiful interface, and I can, well, I could get the code, I have not done that yeah. Uh, let's do that so let's, let's do that later at the barbecue. <laughs> and if it doesn't work, you can still grill it, right? <laughs> 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 okay, thanks again.